All right, John chapter 21, we are continuing in our series uh, this morning on the gospel changes everything, and the topic of this morning is yesterday, and what I mean by yesterday, as it could mean yesterday, is that you came loaded with regrets, you came loaded down with unmet expectations spiritually, it could be, oh, by the way, bye kids, everyone, everyone say bye kids, bye kids, yeah. When the preaching starts, they leave. Don't you wish you were a child, you know? No, I, I'm just kidding. Um, thank you for not saying amen. Um, y- y- those regrets may have happened yesterday. It may have happened a year ago. It may have happened 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. But we come and we are loaded down with things that we have done that we shouldn't have or things that we should have done that we didn't. And if we could turn the clock back, we would not have made that choice. We would not have chosen that sin. We would not have said that or done that or gone there. But the reality is, life says you can't unring that bell. You you, you can't turn the clock back. There is no such thing as a time machine. Well, John chapter 21 provides exactly what we need. And it's in the form of a story and, and one of the things, I, I, I want to I get to it here uh, in a little bit, but one of the unique things about this, um, if you want to follow along in the notes, is the Word of God is, is being challenged because of its authenticity, or it's being ridic- uh, accused of not being authentic. It's mythological, it's legend, um, it's embellished, and nothing could be further from the truth, but really all of those arguments that seem new have been going on for a thousand years. They just are refurbished, redressed, and then put back out there and hoping that something sticks. And one of the things in this story that helps us know about the authenticity of the story itself is how specific it is. Uh, For example, there's going to come a time here that the number of fish is counted and caught. And John is writing this several years, maybe even decades after it happened, and he's remembering what happened. He's remembering this, and he's saying, that's how many fish we caught. There's something that we're going to read in here about Peter, and and he does something very specific, something very unusual, And, and, and John is recounting that, and we're thinking, why in the world would Peter do that? And John is simply saying, well, because that's what Peter did. That's how it happened. And so look for those kinds of things, because legend and mythological writings don't have that kind of specific content, especially the the mythological writings of that period. And so that tells us this, John is remembering this, he's he's recalling these events. There are certain things that John can't remember, and he tells us, I I don't remember. Another thing that's unique about this is, look at, for example, at the very last verse of John 21. This isn't part of our scripture reading, but I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of of us a little bit. Verse 25, John says, now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. John is saying, I have seen and heard Jesus do things that if I were to write everything about them, then then I I wouldn't have enough life left and there wouldn't be enough libraries in the world to be able to account for everything that Jesus said or did. Now that's significant to us because why does he include this story? Of all the stories of Jesus post resurrection and also all the things that Jesus could have said why does John choose why does he choose this story in John 21 over other stories that Jesus did or said? Why does he do that? Well, I, I'm, we'll, we'll get to that, and I want to talk about that this morning. So I, I'm hoping that I've kind of piqued your curiosity a little bit because you're thinking, okay, Craig, let's, re, let's find out what's being said. Also, if you're keeping score, this is probably one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, and so I, I get very excited about it. I, I think I could probably preach a whole sermon series on this chapter alone because uh, it's so powerful. But we'll go ahead and read it. Uh, the first 14 verses, just for our scripture reading this morning. If you're willing and able, would you please stand out of respect for reading God's word? John 21, beginning at verse 1. <clears throat> After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, 
Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish. 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Father, we we want to think great and wonderful thoughts about you. And so allow us to have breakfast with Jesus. Allow us to just merely sit at his feet, learn from him, and learn what it is to know that you want us to know. We praise you and we thank you in the holy name of Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, so that's the story. Real quick, the first three verses tells us that seven of the remaining 11 disciples were, re- were there at the Sea of Tiberias, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee. Jesus had raised from the dead in Jerusalem, and we find now in John 21 that the disciples are 70 miles away north in Galilee. There's the lake, there's a boat, there are some nets. Peter does what he does naturally. He says, I'm going to go fishing. The other guys go with him. They go out fishing. They're fishing all night, nothing. And there is a lot of work involved with fishing with nets, a lot of pulling, a lot of placing, a lot of waiting. It can be very strenuous, very strenuous work. By morning, nothing has happened. They're probably on their way in, discouraged that, you know, we failed Jesus. We can't even fish anymore. We, we are zeros at everything. And all of a sudden they hear or they see an individual, perhaps because of the sun rising or because of the shadows, they couldn't recognize who it was. But someone from the shore asks the ultimate question that you never ask a fisherman who's never caught anything. How, have you, how many fish have you caught? Have you caught anything? And no, we haven't caught anything. And so this person on the shore says, cast your net on the right side of the boat. Try that. Fine, let's do it cast the net out there. They catch so many fish. John makes a special note and says, even the, but the nets didn't break. And he says, we counted 153. Not 154. Not 152. 153. They catch all of this fish, and John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, sees and recognizes who it was on the shore. It's the Lord. It's Jesus. It's the, it's the risen Christ. He tells Peter, you know who that is? That's Jesus. Peter puts his coat on, and then it says, throws himself into the ocean. He doesn't dive, he doesn't cannonball, doesn't jackknife, he falls into the ocean, throws himself in. Who puts their coat on to jump into the water? And yet that's what Peter did. Why? We don't know. That John is just some, that's just what he did. It's Peter. Swims ashore about 100 yards. Swims ashore, probably starts wading, gets there. Jesus is waiting for the disciples. Now, if you've been around men who are working, men take great exception to another man who doesn't work. And John makes a special note. He's writing this story out. He's recounting what happened. Yeah, Peter, he throws himself into the ocean, leaving the rest of the guys to bring in the hall. They get to the shore Jesus is waiting with a fire, some roasting fish, and some bread. And Jesus says, go get the rest of the fish. What did the other fishermen tell Peter? 
listen, we brought him in, you go get him. Peter goes and gets the fish, brings them to Jesus. And then Jesus and Peter had this very wonderful dialogue that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So that's the story. It's a very significant story. And here's why it's significant to us. This is why I believe that John included this story in the very last part of his gospel. It's for this reason. Before the gospel can repair you, it has to wreck you. I think it's important that we embrace that. Before the gospel repairs you, the gospel has to wreck you. And that's very difficult for us because we don't want to be wrecked. We don't want to come to the end of ourselves. We don't want our impurity, our sin, our filthiness to be exposed. And let's face it, we as even church people, we work very, very hard to look as if we're okay. We look very, very hard on gathering Sundays to look as if we've got it together. Marriage, good. Kids, good. Job, good. Everything is good. Me and Jesus, good. We work very hard because we don't want to expose ourselves to the impurity, perhaps the sin, perhaps the filth that we all bear with us many times. And so we don't want to be wrecked that way, but what we learn from this story is that if you want to truly be repaired by the gospel, be ready to be wrecked by that same gospel. Well, how does the gospel wreck us? The gospel wrecks us, the gospel forces us to own our regrets. The gospel does not call us to, hey, listen, you know, that stuff didn't happen. You didn't do that. You didn't say that. Forget about it. Don't just, you know, put in the, bury it so deep that even a therapist will never be able to uncover it. Just don't worry about it. How's that working for you? It doesn't work for you, right? No, what Jesus wants us to do is come to grips with our regrets. Now, regret comes in a couple of forms, and real quick, we'll just go through this. Big sins that disqualify us. It could be that something happened yesterday or that something happened 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago or maybe something is continuing to happen. It could be a habitual sin that you just can't seem to get over, that you can't seem to get control of and it's overwhelming you and it's so big, it looms over you, it serves as an anchor to your soul and you are convinced that you are disqualified because after all, how in the world could Jesus use someone like me who does that or thinks that or goes there or sees that? And we disqualify ourselves simply because of what we have done in the past, and we disqualify that. Peter could have done that. He could have fallen in that category, and perhaps he did for a time until this conversation with Jesus. You see, because Peter was part of the inner circle. By the way, before Jesus was crucified, all of the disciples let him down in some form or fashion. But Peter, Peter was varsity. Everybody else was JV. Peter was part of that inner circle. He had heard and seen everything in public and private that Jesus had said or done. He was part of the chosen three along with John. And, and so they saw these and, and, and he went everywhere that, that, that Jesus was. He was part of that chosen little subgroup within the disciples. But get this, and, and people can argue about this, and I would, I would be part of that argument probably. I would contend this, that what Peter had done was worse than what Judas had done. You see, Judas, Judas betrayed Jesus and got money for it. Judas betrayed Jesus once and was paid for it. Peter, Peter betrayed Jesus three times for free. Three times. Judas couldn't live with himself and committed suicide. Peter couldn't live with himself and goes fishing. He reverts back to what he knew. I stink at being a disciple. I've denied Jesus. I know he's alive. Really glad about that. But he's done with me, and so I have to be done with him. I'm going fishing. And I think that's an indicator, and John, let, that is an indicator that Peter has taken himself out of the disciple game. He has disqualified himself from being a follower of Jesus, even though he knew that Jesus was alive. I know that Jesus is alive, but how in the world can he use some? Look what I've done to him. And that's what can happen to so many of us as Christians. 
Because let's face it, many of the sins that we struggled with before we became Christians, we still struggle with after we've become Christians. And we've been told, listen, hey, listen, since you've become a Christian, sin shouldn't be that big of a deal. You should be able to have victory over it. You shouldn't be doing that. You're a Christian now. And we hear that over and over. And maybe guys like me say those things, maybe between the lines, and you're thinking, I should be more mature than I am. I should be more along in my faith than I am, and I'm not. And so how can I serve this risen king when I'm not what I should be? And we disqualify ourselves. We take ourselves out of ministry simply because I'm not as far along as I should be. I've, I've failed. I've sinned. These big sins are, are holding, holding me back. Big sins that dis- can disqualify us. But then there are also big commitments that can embitter us. I, you, you know that I, I was a church kid. I was raised in the church. And I was raised to go to Warm Lake Church Camp in Idaho. And I went there many, many years. How many of you were raised going to church camp? Just raise your hands. Yeah, a lot of us were. Church camp. It's great. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Our kids go. Or, or, I mean, our, our church kids go. And I, I would go, and every Friday night, the tradition, well, I don't know if they still do that, but every Friday night, uh, the last night of camp, we would have this big, gigantic bonfire, and, and we would have testimony time. And the way that you signaled that you wanted to give a testimony is you'd grab a stick, and you'd take it to the fire, and put it in the fire, and that was the signal to everybody that you were going to talk, that you were going to give a testimony. And so you stand there, and I did this numerous times. You stand there and say, you know, because of what I've learned here at the camp, I'm drawing near to Christ, I've just really grown in this mountaintop. It's been really great being a Christian. I just want to let you know that when I get back into the Boise Valley, things will be different. I'm a new man. I'm a new kid. I'm a new person. I'm going I'm to make commitments. I'm going I'm, I'm to, I've quit sinning. I'm not going to sin anymore. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to memorize Ezekiel. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray two hours a day. I'm going to witness to all my friends. I'm going to win them all for the Lord. And I'm going to be a light on my campus. And I'm going to do great things for God. I didn't say exactly those things, but that was the intent. Years ago, many of you men may have gone to Promise Keepers events, and you go to Promise Keepers, and you go to the stadium where the Raiders play, and, you, and you're with 50,000, 60,000 other men, and it is so powerful, and you're convinced you're coming back, you're going to be a different husband, you're going to be a different Christian, you're going to be a different churchman, you're going to do all these things. Have you done those things? You go to Women of Faith Conference, women, and you make the, all of these incredible commitments, and you go to retreat, or you hear a speaker, and, and you say, I'm going to, I'm going to, things are going to be different. I'm going to make a commitment right now that I'm going to follow in a way that I've never followed before. And inside 24 hours, at least in my case, fail, 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 fail. And you do that enough. You do that enough. You you become overwhelmed with bitterness towards yourself, towards others, and towards God. You do that enough, you experience that kind of failure, and it will do incredible tricks to your soul. And it will absolutely ruin you. Peter had done that. Matthew 26, it should come up here on the wall. This is before the crucifixion. Then Jesus said to his disciples, you will all fall away because of me this night. He's telling all of his disciples, all 12 of them, they're all 12 there, and he says, guys, Before the night's over, you're all going to fall away. Peter answers him. Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Now that's commitment. Now if you've never read the story before, you're thinking, well, that Peter, he is some kind of follower of Christ. Wow, what a commitment. That's amazing. And what does Jesus tell him in that same story? We all know the story. Hey, listen, Peter, um, tonight, that, that's great. Love the commitment. You bet. I want you to listen for a rooster. Be, be, because before you hear it, before you hear the rooster, Peter, you're going to have denied me three times on purpose for free. It won't cost you a dime. And you won't get a dime. You know what Peter's saying there? Hey, Jesus, he's looking at the other 11. You know, all these other 11, all these other guys, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to fall away. I know them. 
Some of them I've done business with. Nathaniel, talk about gullible. James the zealot, yeah, zealot, enough said. John and Andrew, uh, John and Andrew well, Andrew's my brother, and I, I, I love my brother, but hey, he's going to fall away. John and James, I've done business with those guys. Talk about wishy-washy. They, they, will, they don't love you as much as I love you. And so, yes, they will fall away. You're right, absolutely, not me. I'm right beside you. I'm right there with you. Peter had to live with that. And now we come to John 21. And Jesus has appeared to Peter and the disciples. This is the third time. This is the most detailed time that we have in Scripture of post-resurrection Jesus and his disciples. Now, what do you think is going through Peter's mind? Do you think that he just, oh, that was a hiccup. I blew it. You know, you got to love me, Jesus. I, I'm, I'm just so impetuous. I'm just so impulsive. I, I speak before I think. That's just me. Do you think Peter really thought of himself that way? I don't think so. Big commitments can absolutely overwhelm us and embitter us. And we've all been there, all of us. Peter has to come to the end of himself. He has to be wrecked before he can be able to be repaired. And what we have in John 21 is the wrecking crew of Jesus Christ and his grace and the repair of Jesus Christ and his grace. Because we have this very peculiar, very strange dialogue between Jesus and Peter. We didn't have it for our scripture reading, but we're going to read it right now, okay? Beginning at verse 15. Beginning at verse 15, Jesus says, that, or the word says this, when they had finished breakfast, this is John remembering this, right? Okay. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, the these probably mean the other disciples, because remember, Peter compared himself to the other disciples. Jesus, I love you more than these guys do. And I think what, John, what Jesus is saying is, I am triggering a memory in you, Peter. I am going back to that time when you told me you love me more than these. Okay, remember that. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the, Lord, the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Well, what? What, what is happening here? What's happening here is that Jesus is causing Peter to go back Jesus says this different, but you know what, in essence, what Jesus is saying? He's saying this, Peter, did you fail me? Yes, Lord, I failed you. Peter, Peter, did you fail me? Yes, Lord, I failed you. Peter, did you fail me? Yes, Lord, I failed you. That's what Peter is hearing. That's the story being written in his mind. But Jesus says it differently to him. And what Jesus does is he repairs Peter's soul. Peter is overwhelmed with regret. He has taken himself out of ministry. He has disqualified himself. He has embittered himself to the point where he says, I'm going fishing. Not because that's his mission in life, but because that's all he knew. And that's all he knows because he stinks at being a disciple. And there's no way that the risen Christ would ever use someone like him after what he's said and what he's done. And Jesus very well could have just rubbed Peter's nose in it and taken the dagger and just turned it inside. But Jesus takes a knife, but it's not the knife of of a murderer. It's not the knife of a butcher. It's the knife of a surgeon. And he repairs Peter. How does he do it? Well, in the English language, we're somewhat handcuffed when it comes to the Word of God. And we talked about this, I think, a couple of months ago. But in the English language, we only have one word for the word love. And it's Love. 
That's the word. We have one word in our vocabulary. In the Greek language, there are four words for love. Two of them are used in this passage. The first word, and this is where I, I, I want you to, we're going to do motions, okay? So if you are a staunch Baptist and you don't take your hands out of your pocket, change, okay? All right, there's first of all agape. Agape love, it just, would you please do this? It's a great way to meet folks, all right? Uh, this, is a, this is agape love. It's a big love. It's sacrificial love. It's the love that says, I love you no matter what you do to me. I love you no matter what you say or do, no matter what, I am going to love you. It's, a big, it's the biggest form of love. And in the Greek language, it's agape. Some of you aren't doing this, and so therefore, you'll never get it, okay? No, I, I'm just kidding. You don't, if you don't want to, that's fine. And so this is the big love. That's agape love. There's another word for love that's used in this passage, and it's phileo. And gape is this, phileo is this. Phileo is love in the English language, but it's a smaller version of love. It's a friendship kind of love. It's a love that says, I love you because you're funny. I love you because we like the same pizza toppings. I love you because we like the same sports team or our family situations are very similar. There are reasons for this kind of love. I love you because of this. This is, I love you regardless. This is, I love you because. Now, how does Jesus use these two words in this story? He comes to Peter. He's, they're, they're sitting around a campfire. And he basically, and, and work with me on this. Do the motions, okay? Okay, we're going to do this together. Balcony people, I can't see you, but I'm assuming that you're going to work with us on this. Jesus comes to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? Peter responds, yes, Lord. I love you. Jesus asks again, Peter, do you love me? Peter responds, yes, Lord, I love you. Jesus asks him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Now, we did this about four or five years ago, so some of you might remember it. But Jesus uses a play on words. Peter, this is what you thought. You thought you loved me with this big love. You said, even though everybody else falls away, I will never fall away. How'd you do with that, Peter? I blew it. I blew it. And so I, I thought I loved you this way, and I, I, I failed you, Lord. I love you, but not like this. I love you like this. But then all of a sudden, Jesus takes that and says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yeah, I, I love you. And you know what Jesus does? Meets him with grace. In essence, he says, Peter, I'll take that. I'll take that love. Don't give me these phony commitments. Don't give me this grandiose thought that you're going you're gonna to no longer sin and everybody else is going to fall away and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the only one left because I love you more than anybody else. The reality is, Peter, you and I both know now there are people who love me more than you do. Do you realize how freeing that can be for Peter? To know that the Savior knows the degree of love. I know, Peter, that you love me this much. Peter, that's enough. I'm good with this. Don't give me this. I'll take this. Because we have a job to do, Peter, and we're going to do it. And you're going to do it with this. You're going to do it with this. And I will do great things through this. You just need to understand. You need to come to grips with your failure, be repaired, and move forward. I love, that. I love the imagery of that. And so here what we have is, is one more thing to do, is that we embrace this grace. We embrace this grace. How does the gospel repair us? The gospel bids us to embrace this grace. There's, for those of you who know your, your Bibles, you, you know that there's a parallel story to this. There was another time when Jesus told these fishing disciples to cast their nets on the other side of the boat. 
It's back in Luke chapter 5, and Jesus and these guys, they, they kind of probably know who Jesus is because he was kind of the rock star at that time. And he tells them, cast your nets on the other side of the boat. They hadn't caught a thing. They do it somewhat reluctantly, and they catch all of this fish to the point where the nets begin to break. And they come to Jesus, and what does Peter do when he comes to Jesus? He comes to Jesus and he says, get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. You see, that's what our life does before the gospel. We so desperately do not want to come to grips with our filth and our sin and our impurity, and so we don't want to be in the presence of anyone who's beautiful, anyone who's pure, anyone who's good. And so before the gospel, we want to avoid Jesus because he's so pure, he's so powerful, he's so beautiful. But then something happens to Peter. In John 21, same kind of story. Fishing story, cast your boats on the other side of the net, they catch all kinds of fish. Peter hears this, Jesus, what does Peter do? Get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. No, he throws himself into the ocean, or to the sea, and he runs, he swims to Jesus. He can't get, that's what grace does to us. Grace, we, we know that grace is so overwhelming that it bids us to run to him and not flee from him. And so what does Jesus do with Peter? He tells him, hey, feed my lambs, verse 15. Verse 16, tend my sheep. Verse 18, feed my sheep. Up to that point, my guess is, and I'm guessing, when Peter ran or swam to Jesus, couldn't get close enough to Jesus, he was expecting to be told, Peter, it was a good run. Y y your heart was in the right place, but doggone it, I just, I just can't trust you. You denied me. Judas denied me once. You denied me three times. Three times, Peter. Three times you denied me. And so I, I think we just need to break up. Uh, you know, I'm going to kick you out of the band. And, and, and you, know, you go back to fishing. I tried. You tried. It just, it's just not a fit. It's just not going to work. Peter was not, was not expecting, Lord, I love you. Peter was not expecting, then, then Peter, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Tend my flock. Jason, you guys can come on up now, please. You know what Jesus is doing there? He's changing Peter's self-identity. He's taking Peter's yesterday and not changing a thing about yesterday. Jesus doesn't say, Peter, you blew it. Forget it. Forget it. It's all right. No, he's saying, Peter, you blew it. Remember it. Be broken because that brokenness will help you feed my sheep. If Jesus had not had this conversation with Peter, Peter would have been the denier of Christ. He would have been right there with Judas, the betrayer of Christ. Peter's the denier of Christ, and, and he will go down in history as the one who has denied Christ. That's his identity. He's a denier. He, 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 he has rejected Christ. But what Jesus has done in one conversation is he has wrecked Peter and then repaired Peter and said, you are no longer a denier, Peter. You are now a shepherd. Years ago, I told you, Peter, I was going to make you fishers of men. Well, now I'm changing the metaphor. You're going to be a shepherd of my flock. And you're going to use your brokenness you are going to use every ounce of your brokenness. I do not want you to forget what you did, not to rub your nose in it, but to rather celebrate my grace. You have been forgiven, Peter. You have been restored, Peter. You can't unring the bell of what you've done, and you will continually, every time, Peter, you hear a rooster crow, your mind will go back to that day. But don't wallow there, don't stay there, but rather bask and embrace my grace. My grace has forgiven you and restored you, so now get out there, Peter, and serve my people and feed my lambs and tend my flock. 
There's work to be done and use your brokenness to serve broken people. Use your denial to serve denying people. Unleash my grace to others because you now know what a recipient of grace looks like. Brothers and sisters, if we want to change Sacramento, we've got to start there. We have to be wrecked by the gospel. And it could be that you have avoided that your whole life because you have worked so hard to place a facade out there in front of everybody between God and country. And you've put that facade up because you refuse to be wrecked by the beauty and the purity and the power of God. And even coming this morning, in essence, you are saying, get away from me, Jesus, I'm a sinful person. I'll sing the songs, I'll listen to the sermons, I'll greet a few people, but as I scatter from this place, I will take my pain, I will take my denial, I will take my sin with me because I can't bear to expose it to others. And so I'll make big promises. I'll make big promises of commitment to you. I will say all kinds of stupid things that I have no intention whatsoever of following. And Jesus comes to us. He comes to all of us, myself included, and says, you know what? Take the big love. Take it away. I, I, I know what you have. I want that. Because you're my son and daughter. You are who I say you are. You're my friend. You're my sheep. You're my loved one. You're my redeemed. And so take, take this, and I'll give you this, because I have this for you. You have this for me. I'll take that. Now go and jump. Jump in. Just throw yourself into the sea. Sink or swim. You know that Christ will sustain you. And he will do great things through you. That is how the gospel changes yesterday. You've done some really bad things, and perhaps some bad things have been done to you. The Bible doesn't say, hey, deny that stuff. Deny it ever happened. Live and deny your whole life. No, embrace it. It wrecked you. Let Jesus repair you. And he will. All you got to do is jump. And so do that. What that looks like for many of us here, it may be that we're Christians, it may be that right now in the quietness of your own soul, you just come to grips with who you are. You, you forget all of the great promises that you want to make to God, and you say, Lord, I'm a failure, and you seem to really accent working on failures. And so here I am. And so I want to be used by you. I have done this, I have thought that, I have failed you numerous times. And God comes to you and says, then, then get to work. It could be that you're not a Christian. And you never thought about becoming a Christian until maybe now. Because this kind of Jesus you want to believe in, you need to believe in. This kind of Jesus provides repair for you. You've, ta you've thought of everything else to be repaired by. But now, this is the kind of Jesus I want to repair me. Then it may be that you need to jump in by simply talking to someone. Talking to someone about Jesus talking to them about the love that you have, large or small. He will take whatever you have and he will repair you and restore you. That's my prayer for you. And many of us will be up here lingering. If you want to talk to one of us, pray with one of us. We'd love to pray with you and talk to you about this incredible Jesus. And it could be that today is the first time you've ever had breakfast with the Messiah. Thanks for listening to the Arcade Church podcast. Visit us at arcadechurchonline.com, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram.